This morning we're going to be in a series called In Him. And as we celebrate Christmas, uh, we need God's word to help us remember why we celebrate uh, Christmas, right? Uh, it's just, it's easy to uh, get distracted. It's easy uh, to get uh, kind of consumed with uh, shopping and, and, and presents and going to parties, and, and we need God's word to help us remember, like, oh, it's not about those things, right? It's easy to get kind of wrapped up in the nostalgia of Christmas, of, you know, Jack Frost nipping at your nose, right? And so that, that we're chasing after a nostalgia. We're chasing, I got to have cocoa. I got to have a fire. Like, we're just chasing. Like, and that's not, we need God's word to remind us. Like, those things aren't horrible. That's just, that's not what the Bible teaches us. That's not Christmas, Right? Even as we go into the holidays and maybe there's some sad memories of maybe lost loved ones that won't be with us this year, or maybe there's some drama that we've had around uh, Christmas and just we have nightmares, like whether, whether sad or good or bad, like that's not what the Bible teaches is Christmas. Uh, Christmas is uh, God entering into human history. That's Christmas. Uh, Christmas, uh, the angels uh, singing out you know, glory to the highest, you know, peace on earth uh, uh, with all men in whom he is pleased. Like that's Christmas. Right? Christmas is this young couple um, sitting in the midst of like darkness and not really sure how things were going to unfold, and yet none of that mattered uh, because Jesus was coming. Like, son of the Most High was about to enter into human history. None of those like, confusions in the world for this young couple mattered because the one who was going to rule on the throne of David for eternity was coming. Like, that's Christmas, None of those things are wrong or bad, but we need just like we need God's word to help us remember like what is Christmas. And this morning we're going to look at Colossians chapter one. Uh, you can go to the back, grab a devotional, turn to page fifty, go to your Bible, turn to page uh, I don't know chapter one, verse fifteen. We're going to look at Colossians chapter one, uh, verse fifteen. I'll read. You follow along. It says he is the image of the invisible. God, the firstborn of all creation. So just like James said, we're just focusing on one verse this morning. There's 13 words. We're going to draw out uh, these, these words because they're so, they're so important. They're power-packed. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation creation. Next Sunday, we'll just look at verse 16, and then that evening at the Christmas Eve, we'll look at verse 17, and, and, and we're going slowly, word by word, because they're, they're packed with goodness. And so when you study God's Word on your own, um, you always want to look at the context. You, you want to ask the question of who's the audience uh, and who's the author, and for Colossians chapter 1, the, the author is the Apostle Paul. You, you, if you're in your Bible, you could go to, uh, uh, where, this is maybe out of, out of order. Maybe I'm just a little confused. Out of order. Ah, I'm confused. Before we get to uh, the audience and the author, we need to, here, stay with me on this. <laughs> You're, you're going to want to know uh, like that God's word is God's word uh, because you're going to have times where you doubt uh, who wrote God's word. And uh, if it's just a human author, why do we, uh, why do we care, right? And, and God's word is written by the Apostle Paul, but it's ultimately God's word. Uh, and we know that from 2 Timothy 3, it teaches us that all scripture is inspired by God. Uh, but that's the Bible supporting the Bible, um, so it's, it's assumed that the Bible is going to support the Bible as God's word. But what has carried the most weight for me about the uh, authority of God's word uh, is that it's, it's many different authors with one central message. Right? Does that make sense? Like, most of the spiritual writings of our day are uh, just one person going off in the woods 
having a moment and then writing something down and saying, this is from God. Uh, but th that's just one person. Whereas the Bible is 44 different authors, like we saw, 44 different authors um, written over a period of 1,500 years and three different languages, three different continents, and one central message that Jesus is the purpose for all of humanity. Like, that's to me the most powerful point of God's word, that you can trust that this is God's word. Some guy walking off in the woods, like, that's speculation uh, about what he thinks about God. But 44 different authors written over a period of 40, 1,500 years all pointing to one message, like that gives us confidence that this is God's word, um, that we can trust what we're reading this morning. So we're not reading it because it's written by Paul. We're, re we're reading this because this is God's word. So like we were talking about earlier, the, the, the next part we need to be talking about is, is the author. So if you go to Colossians chapter 1, verse 1, we see the author is Paul. And Paul... Um, um, is the, is the human author, that's what messed me up. These slides were just, <laughs> just confusing myself. But the, the ultimate author is God. The second question we need to ask is the audience. The audience is to the saints in Colossae. Colossae is a real location. Like, it's not a mythological location. You can visit Colossae today. It's in modern-day uh, Turkey. And Colossae uh, was, was known for um, uh, these dyes and fabrics and wool where people would come from all around the world to uh, do business. The same way if you went to, you know, Port Arthur and Orange and Beaumont, like that's the golden triangle. People come from all over the world to, to sell oil, but it's not oil, it's, it's, it's fabrics and, and wool. And so the Apostle Paul has gone into Colossae, he's proclaimed the name of Jesus, people have come to faith and a new church has started. A new church has started. That's the same way it happens today. Uh, there's men, women, and children in Jesus from all over the world, in Nepal and Brazil and Chile and, and, and Vietnam and Canada. There's men, women, and children in Christ. We, we proclaim the name of Jesus. People come to faith. New churches are started. And so that's what's taking place in the book of Colossians. And in Colossians... Uh, he writes these words, he is the image of the invisible God. The reason he's writing these words is because the, the people in Colossians were becoming confused about their, their faith. There were false teachers that were minimizing Jesus. They, they were saying that, you know, Jesus is good, but what you really need is this special thing in your life. And we do that sometimes today where people will say like, hey, it's great that you know Jesus, but have you read this book? Have you listened to this podcast? Like, have you gone to this church? Like, this person at this church, like, they're so good. Like, your life is going to be changed when you go to this person, right? The Apostle Paul is like, nah, you're good. You got Jesus. Sometimes we do this in our lives personally. We, we see, uh, like, character flaws in our life or we see our spiritual life hit a lull. And we think, to maybe something's missing. Maybe I need to change cities or I need to be in a different relationship. And God's word is reminding us, no, like you're good because he is the image of the invisible God. Like why would you want to listen to some, some podcast? Why would we want to read some book that was published in 1972? Like you have Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God. Maybe that doesn't land on you so much this morning. Maybe that doesn't uh, grab your attention, but like the idea that Jesus is the image of the invisible God is completely unique to Jesus. I mean, up until that point, all throughout humanity, God has been invisible. Right? Until Jesus, God is invisible. Like people just look for like, like feelings, right? I mean, his divine power and eternal nature has, has been seen, but like we don't, we don't know. So like we, we sense that, there, like have you ever heard people say like that? I, I feel like there's something more to life. Like what are they talking about in those moments? They're talking about the invisible God. 
All right? Sometimes we have people that walk in on a Sunday morning and they're just like, I don't know why I'm here. I just felt like something was compelling me to come. Like, what is that? That's the invisible God. Like most of, most of humanity throughout all of history, like in the 1600s, there's some people, they're very small, like atheists that say God doesn't exist. It's a very small group of people throughout all of humanity. Like most people are convinced that there is a God, but they don't know how to know him. Like he, he's just in this invisible presence. You see it in our culture today, right? When, when, when people pray, when that NFL player collapsed to the ground, the whole stadium, People, the anchors on TV, they say, hey, let's take a moment. Like, for what? Who are we talking to in those moments? Like, when, when the pandemic happened, you go to the doctor and you get a report. When the economy's struggling, like, well, I'm going to send out positive thoughts. To who? Like, what are we longing for in that moment? It's the invisible God. I remember in 2011, Austin council members, they put out a petition that our city, do you remember in 2011, we had a drought and it wasn't raining for so long that Austin's council members thought it's gotten so bad, like they, they issued a, a decree for the city of Austin to pray. To who? Like, that's what the Apostle Paul is writing there in verse 15, that he is the image of the invisible God, that humanity senses a powerful force out in the cosmos, and the Apostle Paul says that's Jesus, and it's because of Jesus that God has become knowable. Like, write that in your devotional, that it's because of Jesus, it's because of Christmas, that's why we celebrate Christmas, that God has become knowable. Up until that point, God is just a mystery. He's invisible. There's just attributes that we know about him, but through Jesus, he's become knowable. I mean, think about our culture right now, like how much skepticism we have. Have you noticed how much doubt we have? How many questions we have? You see headlines in the news, whether it's about Ukraine or Israel or even Kate Cox and the Texas Supreme Court. Like, I read everything with skepticism now. Like, I don't trust anybody. I'm just like, really? What's the angle? Who are they trying to trick? Who's getting the money? Where, where are they trying to manipulate? Like, complete confusion of, like, who to trust. And the Apostle Paul is writing, like, all that confusion has been removed. Like Jesus is the, invis is, is the visible God. The secrets have been made known. The lights have been turned on. I hope that just kind of pops uh, when, you, when you think about that. I, I, I hope that the, that the idea that God has become knowable resonates with your soul. Because let's keep looking at verse 15 and look at that word image. That word image in the original language is the word icon, um, E-I-K-O-N, right? It, it, it means likeness or representation. Uh, so that he is the image of the invisible God is showing us that, that Jesus is God, right? That, that if you, that's what Jesus says, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, so that, the, that they are that they are one, right? So that Jesus is not only knowable, but that through Jesus, God is personable. I mean, up to this point, I mean, we, we might know attributes about God, but now through Jesus, those attributes have become personable. Like God has a face, God's knowable. Does that make sense? I, up to that point, you could look at creation and you could see all the stars, the mountain, the sea, the trees, and, and you would know that, okay, maybe God's creative, but now through Jesus, like you can see his creativity put on display. Does that make sense? Like in the Old Testament, like they, they had seen Pillars of fire, you know, maybe the burning bush, you know, the parting of the Red Sea. But now all those miracles was, were standing right in front of them. His love. Like we might have known God was love, but now in Jesus we see 
Jesus weeping at the death of Lazarus, like God becomes personable, becomes relatable. Like we, we were told God was wise in the Old Testament, but then we saw how people interacted with Jesus, and we saw them in awe of his teaching, and God becomes personable. That's all that we get in Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God. He's knowable. He's personable. We were told in the Old Testament that he's full of, of, of justice and mercy, but now in Jesus we get to see him interacting with the woman caught in adultery. We knew of his humility, but now we see him standing before Pilate as he willingly goes to the cross. Does that make sense? Like he's, he's not just knowable, but he's also personable. He's relatable. Like that's what happened in my life. Like I didn't grow up around Jesus. I didn't grow up going to church. And yet it was through faith in Jesus that God became knowable. I could know him. I could have relationship with God. But with Jesus, it's not that I just knew about God. I could also grow in my relationship with God. I, I, I could grow in my relating to God, that he would understand me, that he's walked in my shoes. That's what Hebrews teaches us, that he can sympathize with our every weakness, that he's personable, he's knowable. It's the power that we have in Jesus. So we need to ask ourselves this morning, do you know this Jesus? The one who is the image of the invisible God. Listen, if you've yet to begin a relationship with Jesus, I would encourage you to do that right now. He's inviting, he's inviting you here this morning to, to trust that Jesus is God in the flesh, that he is the image of the invisible God. If you do know Jesus, then I would ask, do you know the Jesus of God's word? Do you know the image of the invisible God? Are you growing in your understanding and knowledge of Jesus? Like, I don't want to make it too abstract, but think about it this way. Like, when I say the name Jesus, all of us in this room have an image that comes to our mind, right? And by God's grace, some of those images are biblical. They're accurate. But also, for all of us, some of those images are not biblical. They're not accurate. So we need to be growing in our understanding of the Jesus made known in God's word. That's the whole point of Colossians, that there were false teachers that were distorting their understanding of Jesus. They were creating doubt and confusion. That happens still today. Like the reason we have a false understanding of Jesus is because there's false teachers out there. There's false books there's podcasts. There's people that are using the name Jesus, uh, but it's not the Jesus of God's word. That's why we need to know the Bible. That's why we want to study God's word so we can know, like, this is Jesus. That's why we're doing this theological training right now. This is our last day to sign up. All right, we're praying for 10 people. I think we got about eight people right now. You know, you're going to read through a book. You're going to write on it, do one a month for five months. Man, the whole purpose is to put yourself in a place so that you can grow in your understanding of the image of the invisible God, that you would know Jesus. And when you hear people that say things, be it in movies or directly or indirectly, you go, that's not consistent with God's word, right, that your faith would be rooted deeply in him. We're still going in verse 15. Let's look at this phrase, firstborn of all creation. Y'all still with me? Firstborn of all creation. All right, firstborn of all creation. You need to know this is a verse that sometimes uh, can be used to give a distorted view of Jesus. Right, sometimes Jehovah's Witnesses will knock on your door and, and they'll try to explain to you that Jesus is an eternal God, that Jesus is a recreated being. And you'll say to yourself, that doesn't sound right. And they'll say, oh, yeah, look at Colossians chapter 1. And you'll think to yourself, Colossians, that's in the Bible. I know the Bible. What's it say? Well, it says he's the firstborn of all creation. You see, Jesus is not eternal. He's a created being. 
You got to be ready. Like when that language, when it says firstborn of all creation, it's not saying that Jesus is a created being. It's saying he's supreme over all of creation. It's not just Jehovah's Witnesses. I mean, there's churches in our city, most of them in the center part of our city, that will say Jesus isn't God. They'll remove the miraculous. They'll go to chapter 1, verse 15 of Colossians, and they'll say, see, he's just a regular person. He didn't resurrect from the dead. He didn't do miraculous things. And you'll be, you want to be ready. And you're like, no, 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 that firstborn of all creation, that's saying that Jesus is God. It's saying that he is supreme over all creation. Uh, that, that, that phrase, firstborn, that's just language that we don't use today. If you go to Exodus chapter 4, you see, Israel is my son, my firstborn. Psalm 89, and I will appoint him to be my firstborn. Right? That's, that, that language, firstborn, that's language that was used in the first century of the, the firstborn child. And that child would have inherited everything from the family so that all the status, all the wealth, all the power that was from that family, they would have been the exact representation as the firstborn. So that's why the Apostle Paul uses that language. When he says he's the firstborn of all creation, he's saying that Jesus is God, that he's supreme, that Jesus is over all things. In fact, these next couple of weeks, we're going to see that all things are by Jesus, through Jesus, and for Jesus. I mean, at no point does Jesus ever say, I'm just a good guy. He never claimed to be a form of God. He never claimed to, uh, to have some wise words for us to think about. There's a reason that the religious leaders wanted to put Jesus to death. It's because Jesus claimed to be God. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody comes to the Father but through me. Right? That's Jesus. He's the firstborn of all creation. He's supreme. So that we need to ask ourselves this morning, like, are you, are you growing in that truth? Do you know Jesus? Do you not just know about God, but do you have relationship with God? He's personable. He's relatable. He's knowable. He's powerful. Right, that we would be asking ourselves that question. Am I growing in my understanding? Sunday morning worship service is not going to be enough. You're going to want to look at God's word throughout the week. You're going to want to be around other men and women who are growing in God's word so that you're learning about who he is, the image of the invisible God, firstborn of all creation. Do you know him? Is it is possible this morning that you could push back a little bit? It's possible you could push back on that. You're like, Michael, look, if I, if I focus my life on knowing Jesus, if I put my life in a place to be centered on Jesus, like you know intuitively that he's going to disrupt your life. Like you know there's some things that are going to need to change. You're gonna, you know there's things that are not in line with the Jesus of God's word. And so there could be a part of you that's pushing back. You're like, look, if I center my life on Jesus, I might have to change things. I might have to stop doing this or start doing that. I don't know if I want to do that. I don't know if I want to stop or start. I mean, does it mean I need to start, I mean, do I have to vote differently? Like, if I follow Jesus, do I have to vote differently? Like, I don't, I don't, know, I don't want to vote differently. I don't want to spend my money differently. I don't want to, man, I, I, like, I understand why people might make that objection. I get it. But, like, if you see the glory of God, like the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, if you see his glory, for the fullness that it is, then all those objections don't matter. Right? I mean, like, I mean, that's what verse 15 is implying. Like, imagine God in all his glory and power and wisdom and beauty and truth becoming knowable and coming to you and saying he wants to know you for eternity. And that your objection would be, well, does, does that mean I have to change something? I mean, doesn't, doesn't that seem so small? 
Does that mean I have to vote differently because of a political party? <laughs> like, like, what? Who cares? Like, who cares? Like, all those objections, they're so small when it comes to the glory of God being made known in Jesus, that he's knowable, that he's personable, and that he's powerful. And so with that in mind, let's, let's lower the lights. Let's invite our worship team uh, to the front. We invite our elders to the front. We're going to celebrate communion. And communion is a, it's a meal. It's a reminder of, of all that we have in Jesus. All right, the, the cracker is a, it's a reminder of Jesus' body that's been broken at the cross. And, and the juice, that's a reminder of Jesus' blood that's been poured out at the cross. And so as we come forward, we're celebrating the life that we've been given in Jesus. So if our elders would come forward. Listen, if you've yet to trust in Jesus, then I'd ask you to hold off on coming forward. Instead, I'd encourage you to just think about what's keeping you from trusting in Jesus. What are the questions you have? What are the objections you have? And that you would go to God's word and that you would wrestle with those questions, that you would seek out those answers. And if you have trust in Jesus, then before you come forward, I would ask you to think about like Jesus being supreme over all your life. Like, is there some reordering that needs to happen in your life? Maybe there's some relationships, there's some conversations that need to be had. There's some forgiveness that's been withheld. I, I, I would encourage you, before you come forward, that you would decide now, like, I'm going to have that conversation with that person. Maybe there's some decisions that you're making in your life that you know that do not align with God's word. Jesus is supreme over all creation. He's supreme over our, all of our lives. Are there areas of our life that need to be reordered, that need to be disrupted, that need to be placed in line so that before you come forward that you would, you would talk to Jesus and you would confess those things to Jesus, that you would receive his forgiveness and you would commit, Jesus, I'm gonna put you first. Even when it comes with the holidays, maybe you're just bouncing from task to task and present to present. And so before you come forward, you say, Jesus, the, the parties aren't going to get the best of me. You're at the center. You're going to get the best part of my day. I'm going to commit my life to following you. Won't you do that now? Take that time with Jesus and then come forward as you feel led.